Hello, thank you for watching. My name is Jesper and in this video I will talk about the infection mastoiditis. A literal definition of mastoiditis would be when the mastoid air cells within the temporal bone become inflamed. However, the term is most frequently used when describing a bacterial infection of clinical relevance that spreads to the mucosal lining and the air cells that are located within the mastoid process of the temporal bone. It's usually caused by the spread of a lingering untreated middle ear infection. It can be a very serious disease if it's not properly treated and historically it has been one of the leading cause of mortality in children, especially before the introduction of antibiotics. To understand why this infection can be so dangerous, we need to look at some of the anatomy of the structures within and around the ear as well as the temporal bone. The ear lies on top and within the os temporalis, also known as the temporal bone. The outer ear is called the auricle or pinna and it's consisting of skin and cartilage. It opens into the external acoustic meatus which is a hollow passage leading into the eardrum. The eardrum then separates the external ear and the middle ear. The middle ear consists of the tympanic cavity, which houses the three auditory ossicles. These are three small bones that conduct sounds as vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the oval window of the inner ear. This space also consists of air. Another area within the middle ear is the epitympanic recess, which is a space that is located just superior to the tympanic cavity. The epitympanic recess also lies adjacent to the mastoid air cells, and the mastoid air cells are filled air spaces within the mastoid part of the temporal bone, and they function to regulate the air pressure and to protect the temporal bone from injury. They are able to release air into the tympanic cavity when the air pressure in the tympanic cavity is too low. Another important structure we find here is the start or the ending of the Eustachian tube. That's basically a tube that connects the nasopharynx and the middle ear. It's used to equalize air pressure when there's a change between the pressure in the middle ear and the surroundings. Usually it's closed but can be opened upon swallowing and with some different movements such as doing the Valsalva maneuver which is when you close your nose and mouth and then forcefully breathe out and then you will hear a pop essentially and then the Eustachian tube opens and the pressure will be equalized. In children the Eustachian tube is shorter and is lying more horizontally so children are more at risk of developing lasting middle ear infections since pathogens might drain actually into the middle ear instead of the throat because it's more horizontally located. This is why we often see mastoiditis in children and why there was such a high mortality rate before the introduction of antibiotics. The petrous part of the temporal bone is the structure that houses the middle ear and just posteriorly and externally to that we see the mastoid process. The air cells within the mastoid process are small air-filled spaces that work to regulate the air pressure within the mastoid process. They open into the mastoid antrum and can release air into the middle ear in this way. They're absent during birth but develop during the first years of life. Since the mastoid air cells can release air into the middle ear, that means that also an infection that is lingering in the middle ear can also spread into the mastoid air cells back this way. And when this happens, it leads to mastoiditis. Since the bone layers that are lying between the mastoid air cells and the cranial cavity is thin, it's fully possible for an infection to spread into the cranial cavity and cause major complications such as meningitis. It can also disturb the facial nerve or the vestibulocochlear nerve since they are both traveling inside the temporal bone, within the internal acoustic meatus. And this is how the facial nerve gets from the brainstem to the petrous part of the temporal bone. That's its path, and it travels together with the vestibulocochlear nerve. 
So both the facial nerve, the cranial nerve 7, and the cranial nerve 8, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve, can be affected. This can lead to neurological symptoms such as paralysis, hearing problems, dizziness, and strong headaches. The diagnosis is made from patient history, physical examination, and as well as sometimes from doing CT imaging. Symptoms of mastoiditis include swelling and redness of the skin behind the ear. Sometimes the ear will even be filled with pus which might drain out of the ear. And there will be sensitivity and pain in the ear and the skin behind the ear, as well as sometimes there will be difficulty hearing. Several neurological symptoms is possible due to the fact that it can spread into the cranial cavity and also affect the cranial nerves. Further spread into the cranial cavity can further complicate things and might even lead to meningitis. Sometimes patients develop abscesses which needs to be drained. Treatment usually consists of giving the patient antibiotics either orally or if orally is not sufficient or if orally doesn't have a sufficient effect we can give IV antibiotics but sometimes since the infection is within the bone within the mastoid process of the temporal bone antibiotics does not always work and in some rare cases doctors may even have to perform mastoidectomy when they remove that part of the temporal bone. If the patient develops an abscess the surgeon or doctor may have to drain this abscess or may even have to remove it surgically. The best treatment is to prophylactically avoid lingering ear infections. So treating ear infections early to prophylactically avoid the spread further in the mastoid air cells. That was it for mastoiditis. I hope you liked this video and it was understandable. Feel free to subscribe to our channel and watch our other videos. Thank you for watching.